happens today, we're gonna have we're gonna have a couple introductions today. We have a lot of familiar faces. We also have some newer faces, so that's great. Thank you for coming. Um, as many of you know, we had uh, another employee, Kim Khan, who always did the introductions and the brown bags. Um, and Kim left us to go to the World Museum of Mining, which is fabulous for her. She's so excited, and we're so excited for her. Um, so we have hired a new person in that position, um, and this is Tyler Trudnowski. He's a few boy, so let's um, And he's going to be conducting the brown bags from here on out. So welcome, Tyler. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Dr. Alan Newman, and we'd like to welcome him well, back to Butte. Um, Dr. Noonan is an award-winning historian and writer, and Noonan has been Cork City's library uh, historian in residence since 2022. He is the author of this book, <laughs> uh, Mining Irish Lives, Western Communities from 1849 to 1920, which was published in late uh, 2022. And the book was awarded the McGowan Prize for Distinguished Book in Irish American History in 2023 by the Irish American Cultural Institute. Um, again, welcome, Dr. Noonan. And, um, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank you to Lindsay as well for. Let's see if I get that a little bit closer. Um, thank you as well to Lindsay for organizing this and for the Beats of Go Archives for having me. Um, feel free to let me know, am I speaking too high, too low, too soft, too... Okay, very good. Um, yeah, so it's wonderful to be back here again. I did a fair chunk of research uh, for the... Oh, it, is it sound okay? Okay, very good. Ah, we have a yes, okay. Um, yeah, I did a fair chunk of research for this book and uh, there was a slight... Um, misspeaking for the introduction of the book because if we want to do mining Irish lives that book would be interesting and tricky but you know uh, but mining Irish American lives is a very different sort of book it involves mining into both the lives of the Irish people who left Ireland the circumstances which they left Ireland the contacts with which they had with their families back home the places that they came to in America their experiences in America who they interacted with in America and finally, what they themselves thought of the entire immigrant experience. And so I suppose that in a nutshell is kind of what my book is discussing and focusing upon. And for today, I thought about giving you a talk, but I think it might be more interesting just to do a few selections from the book itself, since each word in the book was heavily fought over against many different editors and many different processes of writing. So I don't think I can do better than my own words. You know, fair play to me for publishing it, huh? Uh, but no, we'll do that. We'll have a read of it, and we'll see what you think. And again, uh, we'll do the readings, and if you have any questions at all or anything like that, I'll leave a bit of time for maybe 15 minutes at the end for us to have a chat, have a few discussions, uh, have a few questions and answers, hopefully answers. And uh, after that then, uh, the book is for sale as well, if you're interested in picking it up as well uh, afterwards. And if you want my, as he called it, John Hancock, the old signature, I'm more than happy to deface my own work. So just <laughs> let me know. And again, if there's any problems with the sounds, just uh, give me a bit of notice and I will try and rectify that. There is never any problem with a cart man having to speak louder than requested, so I can always go a bit louder, just let me know. So. Uh, for the opening introduction, I kind of tackle a few of the major sort of historiographical questions. Don't worry, we we'll walk through it together, it's very gentle, it's not too dense. But I did want to set the scene for you so that you had some idea of what exactly it is that I'm kind of dealing with and what it is that I'm kind of wrestling with. So, historian Frederick Jackson Turner defined the early historiography of the American West by postulating that the frontier experience reinvented the immigrant as American. Thus, in this framework, the Irish are mashed into the broader body of white immigrants and effectively erased from the history of the American West. This muting of ethnic distinctions was integral to the early mythology of the American West, with linear or overly rarefied narratives, including cowboys versus Indians and the progress of civilization through manifest destiny, acting as a veneer to justify the territorial expansion West and simultaneously portraying its population as exclusively American. By definition, white and Protestant. This Turnerian school has been thoroughly eclipsed by the new Western history, an approach that made important strides in correcting the historiographical lens. 
This effort focused on the un underwritten history of the exploited, beginning with American Indians and later expanded to include women, Latinos, and Asians. Yet this approach has sometimes failed to explore the very real fissures and fusions between and within cultural groups and subsume the Irish under that broader term, Anglo, British, or white. <clears throat> the ways the Irish saw their experiences in the American West were different from the ways others viewed them and were informed by their own history. Exemplifying the distinctive Irish perspective were Father Eugene O'Connell and Michael McGowan. For example, O'Connell served as the California missions, served in the California missions in the 1850s, where he blamed the decline and the Indian population on relentless exploitation at the hands of rapacious agents. He wrote mournfully, what a people that race of the red man might have become. He has no country anymore. And then, in a resigned Christian hope of the hereafter, he added, "'Tis well he will have a grave and a father beyond it." Decades later, in the far-off state of Montana, McGowan was working in a silver mine at Granite Mountain when he noticed the strong tensions between Indians and the encroaching Americans. He contextualized the origins of the conflict as the result of the actions of greedy white men with friends at court or a planter without conscience. The use of the word clandor rather than the word in vehoder deliberately linked the plantations in Ireland with the contemporary struggles of the Indians in the West. And that word, in a horror, excuse me, uh, settler could also mean squatter. So planter is tied to that earlier idea of exploitation and the plantations in Ireland as well, which is where the English crown seized territory in Ireland, effectively breaking up those smaller fiefdoms of Gaelic Ireland that once existed. Now, again, that second Irish word meaning settler, I use the translation settler, but you know, as I just mentioned, it could also mean squatter. And perhaps I probably, I might have should have, or maybe should have used the second word, because Michael McGowan here is also tying, in a sense, his living there with a sense of transience, movement, and it is often that he calls himself a spalking father, a wandering labor, which is a very particular sort of labor in Irish history and Irish culture, a person who's almost rootless. In the next few lines, he reinforces this parallel. The Indians that were left here and there were in a bad way, and we had a great deal of pity for them. The same thing had happened to ourselves home in Ireland. We knew their plight well. We understood their attachment to the land of their ancestors and their desire to cultivate it, as well as their wish to keep their own customs and habits without interference from the white man. We were interfering with them, I suppose, as well as everybody else, but at least some of us sensed that if they were wild itself, it was not without cause. McGowan simultaneously paralleled the Irish history of dispossession with the experiences of Indians and distinguished the Irish from the white people, on winter bona, a cultural and ideological divorce from the racialized ideas of whiteness. He further admitted their partial culpability, tempering it with a resigned sympathetic tone, contextualizing the Indians' present difficulty as imposed privation and their hostility as justified. He was not looking at the situation as the average Anglo-American would, with the Indians as irredeemable savages or a ground up byproduct within the wheels of progress. The Irish brought their unique worldview with them on their long journeys through the territorial and industrial expansion of the US. And the chapters in this book trace the veins of these communities that spread across the region, revealing how the people organized their lives, their relationship, and their ties beyond the places that they lived. The transnational, sometimes multi-generational migrants traveled from Ireland, often through Britain, to the eastern United States, and then to the American West. Direct lines of migration perpetuated by social networks, for example, from the Bear Peninsula to Butte, played an important role in the emergence of tight-knit neighborhoods such as Corktown and Butte. Britain is also an oft-ignored and important part of the staggered and indirect migration story of Irish miners to the US. They often traveled through British ports, frequently spending time working in mines in Scotland, England, and Wales to earn money for their onward journey. Irish migration was a web stretching across the world and was not limited to a single town or city, with notable exceptions such as David Thomas Brundage's The Making of Western Labour Radicalism, Denver's Organized Workers, 1878 to 1905, 
and Gunther Peck's Reinventing Free Labour, Paul Jones and, American, and Immigrant Workers in the North American West, 1880 to 1930. The limited city or town or state view has become the standard. Even across the broad historiography of the American West, a cursory search for the term Irish in the indices of hundreds of history books on the American West or the dozens of books in the subcategory of mining leaves the distinct impression that the Irish melted into the background of American history rapidly and effortlessly. One edited collection opens with the clarion call, European immigrants are the forgotten people of the West. And certainly, the complexities and diversity of the European immigrant population of the West have yet to be fully recovered from the mythologizing period that forged the first history of these places. The research in the following pages arose out of these explorations and in turn reveals in a direct way that the Irish cannot be divorced from any part of the American West. Correspondingly, mining cannot be extracted from the history of these places. Its present lingers on through the imprint of a thousand abandoned mine shafts and ghost towns in the landscape of the story of these communities now living in these regions. The reasons the influence and breadth of the Irish were forgotten in historiography vary based on the period and the field of study. The subcategory of mining preoccupied itself with the technological and operational aspects of the industry. For example, explorations on the subtleties of ethnic identity usually only extended so far as to mention Cornish miners largely because their notoriety as the premier skilled hard rock miners in the 19th century and the famed mining traditions of Cornwall. Greater focus on the mixed composition of the workforce and a wider awareness of the diversity of mining experiences distracted from the economic narrative, one that seemed to operate on the premise that the, quality, the quantity of the material mined rather than the workers who mined it defined the story of the extractive industry. This led to an overemphasis on technological changes that sidelined the transformations in the mining workforce, the most important of which occurred at the end of the 19th century, when Eastern and Southern European peoples overtook British, Irish, Chinese, and German residents as the largest immigrant groups, a change that further subsumed the Irish into the Anglo or British category for the sake of a simpler historical narrative. Yet, a simple narrative does not simply does not easily accommodate cultural distinctions of the story of Irish miners in the American West, either in the first part detailing the often thin occupational line between miner and mucker or labourer, or later in telling the story of how the Irish interacted and worked with other ethnic groups, in particular the complicated relationships between them, the Chinese, Finns, Italians, and others. These distinctions are prerequisites for any attempt to understand the development of trade unionism in the American West, and like others. Miners' days to day were determined more by their social circles and their interactions with others than by the technology of their occupation. And it is impossible to understand why some would be in favor of trade unionism or opposed to workers' organization without the context of personal identity and the experiences of circumstance. Stability, better wages, and safety were defining motivators, broadly, encapsulating as, broadly encapsulated as opportunity, but in many cases, this was a secondary consideration compared to the close bonds of family, friends, and faith that tied them to each other and gave their lives meaning. Despite repeated dislocation, community anchored many to their sense of self and society and played a vital role in miners' lives. The men and their income proved, provided a foundation for what emerged, but the structure was built by women, priests, nuns, and children without whom Irish communities were effervescent. effervescent. Although hundreds of smaller outposts in the form of mining camps and prospectors dotted the landscape, most mining during the period was an urban occupation because the workforce required to work the larger, deeper mines necessarily gave rise to sizable towns. The population density proved alluring to Irishmen who disliked the isolation of American agriculture and remembered the fresh trauma of the Great Famine on Gartha Moor. The examples of Virginia City and Butte, chapters three and six, suggests that Irish women shared the same preference for urban frontiers rather than rural ones. And if women appear as secondary actors in portraying the life of these mining towns and communities, it is not intentional, but instead represents the scarcity of first-hand accounts from the figures coupled with the occupational dominate, dominance of males in mining. The limited surviving miners' letters, fraternal records, and company records are almost silent when it comes to the role of women in the 19th century mining towns. Parish records, such as the internment book of Smartsville, California, the patient logbook of Virginia City, and the census records, which I use extensively, 
reveal some aspects of their lives, but represent the barest of starts in an effort to comprehensively detail women and their families' role in ethnic communities throughout the mining diaspora. And I suppose I can mention here Mary Murphy's excellent work on the Butte as well, a relatively groundbreaking book on the social and cultural elements of Butte. This project began with the discovery of a series of Irish immigrant letters in an early version of the Irish Immigrant Database, which I found on a research visit to the Irish Migration Centre in Oma. Further research led me to Professor Kirby Miller, who generously granted me access to his vast collection of letters, and which included many that contributed greatly to our understanding of the lives of Irish migrants in the American West. In the context of this period, the surviving letters are a fragment of what was once a global communication network. They offer a fascinating window into the thoughts and feelings of the Irish scattered across the world and the types of information that they thought was important to share. Newspapers provided another major source of information and both tools relied on migrants' abilities to read and write, or at least know someone who did. As literacy increased, so too did migrants' reliance on them for information. The letters often asked relatives in Ireland to send them newspapers so that they could read local and national news, and the shrinkage of the world through regular news correspondence and faster communication also encouraged the formation of Irish societies and fraternities dedicated to causes dear to the migrants' hearts, such as the ancient order Hibernian, Hibernians, whose limited surviving records are utilized in chapters three and six. The importance of ethnic identity and the uniqueness of Irish miners in the 19th and early 20th century America is a constant refrain of the primary sources of the period. Their lives expose a distinctive web that hubs concentrated in mining towns and reaching across America and worldwide back to Ireland. The history of Irish involvement in the US mining industry details a relentless effort to earn a fair income and form a community despite repeated setbacks, often created by Anglo-Americans in positions of power in mining companies. Management stoked up and armed nativist groups in an attempt to divide town, towns and pit communities against one another. The following chapter set out to explore the degree to which the Irish-American experience differed from those of other ethnic groups and demonstrates how Irish-Americans interacted with those groups within the backdrop of each location. Comparisons between these local case studies highlight the complexity of the story of the Irish miners in the American West. And Irish men, women, and children shared broad interactions with other peoples. Their rich tapestry of cultural experiences expressed in these identities formed the backdrop for complex encounters as the Irish sought to survive and thrive in the space that they built for themselves in mining areas. To be an Irish miner in the American West was to be both uprooted and transplanted many times, and a wandering labor whose home and community would always be transient, ephemeral in a way. And yet, the time and effort spent building and rebuilding their homes and communities again and again was not futile. It sustained them, most obviously in their identity, while also strengthening them. These links forged demanded respect from others, and this local power was linked to other Irish networks as far distant as the mythologized homeland, inviting them to follow and deepen the legacy. This is hinted at on the scattered headstones describing the parish of origin, in the Irish counties listed in hospital books next to Irish patients, in the malevolent letters written among American mine managers about their Irish workers, and on the statues of St. Patrick in the many Catholic churches scattered throughout those vast expanses. Being Irish could ensure that one would find employment in Butte but not 60 miles away in Marysville. It could offer companionship within unions or fraternities, but court hatred from vigilantes and masons. It created a sense of community, but placed the Irish and their communities beyond the American pale. Inevitably, a degree of accommodation and an element of friction were the consequences. The trials and the trails of the Irish in the mining frontier of the American West illuminate some forgotten historical stories and place them as an important piece in the wider puzzle, that of the Irish diaspora. And so the next section is a little bit shorter. Um, it's just two pages, but I'm talking more uh, in quotations or sections than about this. So this is from the opening chapter, and it's called Irish America. While born in and nativity figures are useful, they are not the most accurate reflection of the size of the Irish communities in the American West. For this, we need to include those whose parents were Irish. Even the use of this more accurate measurement fails to capture the totality of these communities, however. 
Evidence of this is more clearly seen in the traces they left throughout the regions in the form of churches, schools, hospitals, and the names of streets and overgrown graveyards. The establishment and growth of Catholic congregations in mining towns and camps, and the accompanying infrastructure that sprung up wherever the Irish settled provided further evidence of a parallel culture distinct from other ethnic groups, including Americans. One highly visible strand of this identity is the Irish adherence to Catholicism. The other strand was cultural, most visibly seen through the formation of Irish organizations that furthered their ability to maintain links within their immediate community, across America and in Ireland. Both strands were intertwined and spread across the globe in the form of transnational links that provided important conduits for Irish mobility and sources of comfort and familiarity during the periods of transition. The braided strands of identity, religious and cultural, helped these migrants create what became known as Irish America. Of course, other Irish-born residents did not subscribe to this identity. Most Irish Protestants in mining towns allied with and identified with and acted so closely akin to native-born Americans that they could be, can be considered a substrata of that group. Only occasionally did they choose to separate themselves with the label Scots-Irish. And when they did so, it was mostly to clarify that the land of their birth or ancestry could also be home to Protestants. The overall number of Irish Protestant miners in the US was small, probably low single digit figures. This estimate is based on the small numbers of Protestant miners in the north of Ireland, at places such as Coal Island, or even in Castle Comer in Kilkenny. There was also a limited degree of apostasy for the Irish who chose to assimilate entirely into American society, their surname being the sole indicator that they had any links to Ireland. Certainly, there is a degree of difficulty in assessing identity over time. And this cross-generational cultural transfer within families whose parents were of different ethnicities remains largely unexplored in the 19th century. And so it figures for second generation Irish Americans in this book. In spite of heavy revision upward for the size of the Irish American community in the West, a figure which probably doubles the, kind of the traditional size of the Irish communities in American Western mining towns, the figures in the book actually tend towards conservative by tallying only those for whom both parents were Irish born. For the vast majority of the second generation in 1880, this was the case, and they were ethnically Irish, or as they called themselves, Irish American. And despite the use of this far more accurate figure than previously used, this effort prevents, to prevent overestimation, a bit conservative on my part, meant that the figures may represent a slightly conservative estimate for the size of the entire Irish American community. And so you'll see this whereby I use, um, I suppose big data is what you'd call it, but the digitized American census in order to gasp, grasp a better figure of what exactly the size of these Irish American communities were. But we're finally getting into the sort of the guts of it anyway. The new identity often manifested itself through efforts to help those in Ireland or longing to return to the motherland. Other miners noticed the Irish tendency to reminisce and romanticize their home. The Scottish mining bard, Davy Robbie, wrote, Reflections of an Irish Emigrant in 1908. Away o'er the sea is the land of my fathers, far over the ocean my heart turns to thee, but fond recollections of childhood ne'er wither, for green in my memory is Ireland to me. And of course, Rob has very little to actually do with Ireland at all. He was born to a Scottish mining family in Staffordshire, England, and migrated to Ohio in 1902. But Rob wrote these lines either because of a personal familiarity with Irish music and culture, or in an effort to evoke the popular theme of Irish longing for Ireland. The well-established motif can be seen in contemporary Irish sheet music, including Aaron is my home, come back to Aaron, exiles of Aaron, and almost home. The popularity of such songs cont contributed to the popularity of this Irish stereotype. And of course, you have to remember that Irish miners used many labels to define themselves. Irish, Catholic, worker, minor, unionist, Irish-American, Democrat, whereas Irish Protestants adopted solely the term Scots-Irish. The failure to appreciate the differences between ethnic group and race led historians into difficult, difficult territory, as happened in Philip Mellinger's otherwise excellent book, Race and Labour in Western Copper, where he terms the simple ethnic alliance between the Irish and Connor miners in Bisbee, Arizona, nativist alliance. The following sentence illustrates this apparent confusion with the use of ethnic terms. The Protestant Anglo-Irish co-mingled and to a limited extent were socially connected to the Catholic Anglo-Irish, 
while the non anglo Irish were both physically and socially separated from both of the other groups. <laughs> no sense, I'm afraid. <laughs> Mellinger's use of the hyphenated term Anglo Irish is problematic because it subsumes the diversity of Irish immigrant culture and language under the phrase Anglo Irish, mm. one that has particular context and meaning for Irish studies. Perhaps most importantly, it was not a term that the Irish miners used in reference to themselves. The author's main point that it would be impossible to ally if the Irish or Cornish had no intercommunication is valid. His case study reflects similar events repeatedly shown in the present work that the shifting system of ethnic alliances and social exclusion were powerful tools of labor and communities in the 19th and 20th century. And then I just want to reference one other thing. John F. Kearney wrote in the Miners Magazine in 1903, he wrote uh, a poem titled, A Scotto-Irish American's Protest. <laughs> and now for John F. Kearney, that's interesting because he was born to Irish parents in Lanarkshire, up in Scotland, and then migrated over to America. So he does have that multifaceted, layered uh, sort of identity. And his use of multiple identities doubled as a pun, and an attempt to encourage worker solidarity by putting in as many hyphens as possible. The importance of identity and culture were intimately understood by the working class, as further exemplified by Mother Jones, who was actually at the Irish born, Cork born, not to talk too much about Cork, but the uh, Cork born Mary Harris, who adopted a Welsh pseudonym in a sophisticated mimesis of a bridge, a tub bridge, excuse me, to bridge ethnic divisions by cloaking herself in the artificial identity of another. Carney and Mother Jones were just two among many who attempted to unite disparate cultural groups under the class umbrella. These distinctions between various ethnic groups would have important consequences for where the Irish lived, who they socialized and prayed with, how their children would see themselves and negotiate their places in the United States. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of further context uh, for what that difficulty of dealing with such a simple phrase, <coughs> Irish American, meant to these people who really did have to sort of wrestle with so many different groups and different questions about what it was that they would call themselves. The inherent transience of mining communities that arose from working a limited resource does not explain why so many Irish chose to travel constantly from place to place as Spalpini Fáraca, wandering laborers. While some moved between occupations, between mining and logging for example, most miners remained working at what they knew best. Their paths of seasonal migration took them north to Butte and Court Lane during the summer, and back to the warmer climes of Arizona and New Mexico during the winter, constantly migrating in a large shifting circle. And so in this particular area, I'm not talking about those more permanent mining towns like existed in Butte. I'm talking about these other um, migratory patterns, what was called, with some element of pride, hobo workers. Hobo became a term that became derogatory later on as it was sort of manipulated and abused by various companies uh, in effort to stop these workers from moving around place to place. But back in the 19th century, there was a great degree of pride and a sense that they were living a more American life by being free to move around from place to place. One local in Burke, Idaho, when asked about a number of what's called, what he called, excuse me, tramp miners, estimated that there were maybe two or 300 miners in Burke alone who would stay at two large hotels work for two weeks, and then move on. There was no mention of violence or other disruption associated with them or with this process. <coughs> well, that I explain a little bit more about the hobos here, actually, and I think I'll go into it if that's okay. These men were often referred to as hobos, but the present meaning of the word differs from its 19th century usage. Evelyn Stitt Pickett wrote, hobos between 1870 and 1910 were seldom ignorant misfits or begging bums who stole for sustenance, but rather working men caught in an endless round of cyclical employment. These were men who worked in a range of dangerous settings for the little that they had in life, but they were proud of that fact. There is a pride among them in their work, similar to that of every free-born American citizen. The ruthless hobos were in some ways freer than those Native American, native-born Americans referenced, and many of those hobos were legal American citizens. Exact figures are impossible <coughs> to ascertain but many were Irish-American, including the itinerant poem Rochelle and Omar Hartwig, whose poems I include in the appendix of this book. 
both directed their pessimism not just at mining or the transient lifestyle, but also towards their employers' disrespect for them as working men. Quote, no genuine hobo wants to be addressed, come boys, which is the general expression used when referring to working native or local labor. Experienced foremen call hobos men. Their sensitivity over the specific term boys and men emphasized an expectation of respect from employers and a keen awareness of the ways masculine language and class shaped the occupational experience. Partnered with Irish American hobos were other hyphenated Americans with roots in Western or Northern Europe, and the term hobo became foremost overarching identity for this di diverse group, representing an emergent sense of brotherhood and helping them to differentiate themselves from more recent second wave immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe. Employers detailed the difference between hobos and the more recent, quote, European laborers, rating hobos as more skilled and harder working jack of all trade workers. Because of their mobility, they were considered less reliable and more difficult for companies to control, except in the case of emergencies. European laborers are usually quitters in emergencies. Not so with the hobo. Emergencies are his delight. To be a hobo, or indeed a hyphenated American, created a degree of suspicion amongst many other Americans derived from a false equivalence that by refusing to commit to a single place geographically, they were also refusing to commit their political loyalty to one nation, the United States. Over the course of the early 20th century, a growing social stigma became attached to transients, although it was not perceived as such by Irish American hobos or their relations. Michael Joe McGuire, the eldest son of a Grass Valley gold miner, worked in silver mines in Virginia City, the copper and gold mines of Montana, and Idaho's lead mines before he joined the Alaskan gold rush in 1889. He eventually worked in Tonopah, Tonopah? Tonopah Nevada, where he earned the nickname Wild McGuire. Thank you. Every time he sold a mine claim, he drank and poured until the mine ran out. That's a quotation. He eventually died in a gunfight in 1918 at the Empire Mine, less than two miles from his family home. The family remembered how the firstborn had disgraced the family name, and they believed that Joe's wildness and his tragic death contributed to his mother's passing. The McGuire's family shame regarding Joe, however, did not stem from his footloose nature. Others in the family were similarly mobile, but instead was centered on his sinful carousing and drunkenness. Similarly, Bill Keating, an Irish-American balladeer, referenced how others viewed his movement as commonly accepted part of the song. Say, Pete McAvoy, here's Bill Keating the scamp, just back Pete's suppose from a million mile tramp. It's a wonderful uh, anthracite mining song called Down, Down, Down. Uh, although mine companies frequently imported workers, they disliked worker transiency because it undermined company control of the workforce. A sedentary, established workforce gave the company greater leverage against workers if they wanted to lower wages or raise prices at the company store. A mobile workforce weakened the effectiveness of blacklists and could quickly sap the minds of their skilled workforce, particularly during a strike. There was also the possibility that traveling miners had been un could be union organizers or radicals. Furthermore, there was cultural discrimination against the minor mobility. As Roger Burns, as Roger, excuse me, as Roger Bruins points out, the distrust of hobos was reinforced by the belief that the hobo lifestyle opposed a natural American, or American order because it, quote, worshipped idleness, thereby turning <laughs> Protestant work ethic upside down, which is ironic, as I've already told you, hobos are actually considered during this period the hardest workers of the workforce, the ones willing to take on the dangerous work. This also explains how businesses scaremongering, businesses scaremongering tactics against hobos proved so successful. And when the journalist Frederick Wedge heard that the industrial workers of the world was bent on overthrowing the government, he decided to infiltrate the radical labor organization. He secured a union card and masqueraded as an IWW member, living a hobo life and traveling the railroad. He was arrested for possession of an IWW card and the Little Red Songbook. After his experiences, he wrote a book, and he concluded that hobos were honest and hardworking, further adding that he now believed that wobblies cared more about improving workers' conditions than about any sort of revolution. Police and detective agencies nurtured a public fear of vagrants through a variety of means, including distributing wanted signs emblazoned with eye-catching headlines such as, look out for tramps, thereby connecting vagrancy with criminality 
and poverty in the popular consciousness. These actions reinforce the emerging distinction between the 19th century migration involved in the mythologized winning of the American West and the 20th century sedentary closing of the frontiers. In addition, a now marked movement as respectable and vagrancy as criminal, meaning that mobility, both geographical and occupational, was defined by class and ethnic identity. Surveillance, so heavily relied upon by government and businesses against homos, was likewise used by, used by others, sometimes surprising organizations. In the mining town of Randsburg in Southern California, a Thiel detective agent, agency spy noted that the unions were also keeping track of workers. Quote, there were some strangers in the town whom he, Thomas McCarthy, a union leader, kept track of and who were of a class of hobos that drifted into mining camp around payday. The hobo could do little to challenge his increasing demonization by companies and unions. If work conditions proved too harsh, a disgruntled hobo would simply up and leave rather than strike. And of public fear that local authorities or organization made life unbearable, he left, knowing that he risked his life if he stayed. One of the final nails in the coffin of the wandering miner came about as an unexpected side effect of slowly improving industrial conditions due to the mine company's general introduction of medical screenings for new workers. This is the quote. Until they got these doctors, checkups, and that then eliminated them real quick because they couldn't pass a physical. That broke the circle of the tramp miner. With their lungs scarred from inhaling dust from the mines, these older miners were more wrecks than relics of a bygone era. A few surviving poems and letters reveal how they internalized their economic insecurity and partitioning from mainstream society with a sense of failure and isolation. One historian who contact, conducted interviews of miners throughout Nevada recounted, an 81-year-old Irishman lived in a small yellow railroad shack. His pension check was signed over to the proprietor of a small store who supplied his basic grocery needs. During his almost 60 years in Nevada, this lonely son of Galway had worked in every county in the state. He had finally grown old, and with neither a wife nor relatives our close friends, he was quietly awaiting death in the railroad cabin. After patiently answering questions, the interview, he explained, the interviewer's questions, he explained, this is the first time in my 60 years in America that anyone has shown the slightest interest in who I am or what I am. The historian who wrote this did not offer the man the dignity of being named, but his name was Frank Casey, and he had worked in Butte and other mining towns before finding himself at the end of his lonely path. It is difficult to imagine the depths of this man's loneliness, and despite the Irish webs of family and friends stretching across oceans and continents, the diaspora had wild many gaps wide enough for people to fall through and become forgotten. A fresh examination of the statistics used to track mobility help us refocus on the forgotten and rediscover overlooked primary source material. The ability to glimpse the past more accurately allows us to see more clearly the paths trod, such as those of Seamus Farquhar from Kerry through New York to Butte, and the connections forged, such as those enabling Nellie Cashman to become a miner, a woman who I opened this book with, uh, not a Cork woman actually by the way, <laughs> or sundered as they wore for Frank Casey, who I was quoting about just there. This deeper context for the understanding of ethnic formation and definitions of identity in turn helped contextualize the roots of societies, organizations, and communities, as well as their waning. And although it is difficult to find a mine that did not have an Irishman working in it in the 19th and 20th century in the American West, the cities of Butte and Leadville will strongly retain their historical and cultural memories of once thriving Irish mining communities. They may be unusual in this regard, but many other Irish mining communities existed throughout the American West during this time. The history recounted in the following chapters is an attempt to illuminate some of the forgotten stories and those whose only historical record is often a weathered piece of granite detailing their name, date of birth, nationality, and, unlike the American headstones they send beside, their home parish in Ireland. These relics are some of the remaining physical markers and not the only traces of the <coughs> remains of a pervasive Irish element in the mining towns of the American West. 
The most obvious are the many Irish living in the United States today who count their ancestors among those who lived and labored in these places, knowingly or not. And so I'm going to jump a little bit further into the book. And yeah, I think I might want to talk a little bit about the I think it's very powerful when you're able to use the voice of these people who really, you know, the voice has been, has disappeared from the historiographical uh, record. And so, if it's okay, I'll read a little bit. A little bit uh, from some of the letters as well. So this is page 128. Um, what it meant for them to sort of emigrate and to leave. While many made a living, some became, and some became wealthy, the letters reveal the failure and isolation of many Irish miners on the frontier. Failure, like identity, was a spectrum of experience, and even with their Irish networks, some found themselves trapped by the shame of poverty or by the length of time they had spent in America. W. L. Kennedy, a miner in Kern County, California, wrote to his cousin James Gilmore in County Down in 1879 and asked, I have not had a letter from home now from anyone in our family for more than a year. Isabella used to correspond with me regularly up till lately, and I fear very much either that she has been sick or is dead. The latter, I fear. I would like to know if cousin John Gilmore is living and his address, I presume, if he is living, I presume he is a very rich man in Australia. He concluded on a resigned note, saying he would prospect in Arizona, and that, I have mined for so long now, I am hardly good for anything else, and I have lived for so long on the frontier, I can hardly live anywhere else. He also mentioned that he had a brother in Australia, but had not communicated with him for decades and thought he might be dead. Despite the lack of contact, his relatives were never far from his thoughts, such a lack of contact over a long period was not uncommon, and the cause might have been neglecting to write family or some sort of dispute. Patrick Dunney, the out one spat that had gone on for months. I am very much surprised at Christy not writing to me before this time. I expect he is angry at me for what I told him about Richard, but I congratulate myself for what I told him was nothing but what is true, and what he requested of me to do, he told me to send him the true account, true or bad, and that I only done. These communications were personal and human, not just consisting of well wishes, but also describing news, arguments, petty grudges. Letters ran the full gamut of the family experience transformed into a communication system across vast distances. Sitting down to write a letter gave the migrant precious time for reflection. Reviewing his life in one letter, Thomas Higgins asked himself, was it worth the price? Would I do it all over again? Knowing the future as I know now, the past, I certainly would hesitate before embarking on that field of adventure a second time. Higgins was one of the miners who had struck it rich, and coming from him, the meaning of loss changes from a financial one to the loss of opportunity. The opportunity to return home if they wanted, to earn the respect of friends and family they had left back home in Ireland, to have something more than a deep sense of regret and loss after all their work and pain the refashioning of these Irish communities and mining towns throughout the American West was not just an attempt to consolidate jobs, powers, power, or respect within American society. These communities offered the Irish an intimate familiarity without which they were, more, they were often sorely detached, not just from home or parish, but from their logos, from their definition of themselves. Most of them would never return home or make a fortune but these communities gave meaning to many during their lives in the dusty realm of the Great Basin. When a fire engulfed Virginia City in 1875, Irish mine owner John Mackey shouted at the crowd trying to save the Catholic Church, damn the church, we can build another if we can keep the fire from going down those shafts. <laughs> Historians quote this line as evidence of the relative worth of religious versus economic infrastructure on the frontier, but that's only part of the story. Mackey's statement was a reinforcement of a social contract among the Irish mine owner, his Irish workforce, and the Irish community. 
The church was rebuilt, and Father Minogue, the local priest of the parish, took the opportunity to make the new building even more magnificent than the earlier one. It still stands there on the rugged slopes of the Sierra Nevadas, a statement of endurance by the Irish of Virginia City and the communal bonds that supported and sustained them. Without this mutual respect and shared affinity to come together, business leaders reaped different consequences for their actions, namely fractiousness and violence as the Irish tried to carve out a piece of the American flag for themselves. And when talking about that fractiousness, the two locations in particular that I used to talk about are uh, Colorado and uh, Leadville, Colorado, and then also the Coeur d'Alene uh, mining area, mining district. Um, and that incorporates chapters four and five. Uh, there's also a particularly entertaining quotation from one mine manager who was writing as the Irish trade union, uh, Irish dominated trade union in Coeur d'Alene are organizing themselves for a strike, uh, have actually struck now at this point. And the mine company were planning this, they hoped that there would be a strike. And in communicating with the mine manager up in Marysville, not far from Butte, not far from here, uh, the mine manager up in Marysville writes to the mine manager over in uh, northern Idaho. And he says, uh, I sincerely hope that you will teach the lesson the, I sincerely hope that you will teach the Irish a lesson that they will not soon forget. So that will give you an idea of the indication of both how large the Irish presence was in this place in Northern Idaho, how dominated the trade union war by the Irish, and then also by the attitudes of the mine managers as well. Now, I suppose it would be a terrible shame if I didn't talk about Butte, Montana while I'm here, or Butte, America, going on. I should correct myself. And so there's a detailed story about the relatively fractious period uh, during the First World War and connecting it to Ireland. I could give you that part, but I might give you just the context for Butte and see what you're going with. And uh, you know, you can all contact me later on if there's problems with the later section. I think it's there. Yeah, it's, it's not bad. But uh, yeah, let's see what you think. relatively fun section um, from a song that I had researched in the Library of Congress, or found in the Library of Congress, it's a collection of folklore um, that was poem songs and stories, and uh, it's there in the, like I said, in the, the Library of Congress, very interesting collections that they have there, and, uh, but anyways, the exceptional longevity of Butte's minds stood defiant in the face of the different fear in the minds of the Irish community here, that the minds would not last. This was a consequence of their internalized sense of exile from the homeland and the psychic scars from repeated exposure to economic cycles of insecurity, resulting in a people more inclined to invest in goods they could take with them than, than those that they had to leave. Excuse me. Uh, this community was both cohesive and transient, and it enabled the Irish to earn enough for themselves and their children to move up and out of mining. This mobility was effectively a quality of life issue for the Irish miners, and I'm speaking about Butte. Second generation statistics show a great degree of occupational mobility for the second generation of Irish miners as they're working here. Often their children chose not to go into mining and instead chose uh, other occupations, teaching or uh, various other jobs. Butte offered the availability of stable work for any Irish miner who wanted it, the existence of an increasingly powerful Irish community, and simple respect from the company in return for the serious risks the men took while laboring in the bowels of the earth. This stood in stark contrast to the atmosphere of suspicion and hostility in other mining companies, such as Marysville, and across state lines in the Coeur d'Alene Mining District. Irish miners were willing to accept the workplace dangers in Butte, since the advantages there outweighed the many disadvantages that prevailed in other locations. Thus, <coughs> many came to the city from all over the Irish diaspora. And this is from one of those particular poems. There were miners from Bisbee, and some came from Cork, some came from New Jersey and some from New York, and a big-bellied Dutchman from over the Rhine got a job slinging, slinging muck in the mountain con mine. <laughs> the 
As the song states, the Irish came not just from Ireland, or other mining regions in the American West, but also other parts of the US. The children of Butte's Irish born were most commonly born in Michigan, highlighting the mass migration from Keweena, the copper mining area of the Upper Peninsula. The second most prolific birth state for children was Pennsylvania. These same paths applied to the children of Butte's second generation Irish. The transfer request records of the Robert Emmett Literary Association, the radical plan the Gale Front, point to this movement path from Avoca in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, to Butte. And the AOPH also listed Pennsylvania as the semin second most common place from which members transferred between the years 1884 to 1892 and 1905 to 1916. The anthracite coal company's discriminatory hiring practices and vigilante promoted violence against the Irish caused them to leave those states from Montana in the 1880s and 1890s driven westward. In both Pennsylvania and Michigan, opportunity had disappeared, replaced by company hostility towards the Irish, making the choice to follow the promising letters calling them to a new land much easier. And In Butte, the Irish, portrayed as unruly and disruptive by mining companies elsewhere, were remarkably docile once they garnered respect from their employers and a commensurately <coughs> less sta stable wage. Over the 38-year period between 1878 and 1916, the BMU, Butte Miners Union, was one of the most peaceable unions in America, with a membership as high as 6,000. Butte miners and their income provided vital financial support for other unions across the American West. The BMU's use of this power led to it being called the greatest single social force of the working class in the western part of America. Remarkably, it never led its members out on strike or challenged the industrial coalition that served as the economic bedrock for the community. This flew in the face of commonly accepted belief, this, excuse me, flew in the face of a commonly accepted belief amongst labor historians that the further west one went, the worse labor conditions and the more militant union, unionism became. A comparison of the peaceable labor situation in Butte with other mining districts with sizable Irish communities, such as Leadville and the Coeur d'Alene Mining District, casts a dark shadow over the wisdom and motive of companies that spent vast sums on private security and armed militias instead of compromising and negotiating with labor. The many examples of management's private and public correspondences in previous chapters demonstrate that it was not a mathematical equation measuring costs versus benefits. Their ideological and prejudiced attitudes predisposed them to an inability to accept compromise. Their ambitions were focused less on profit and more on control, which in most cases they refused to share with their workers or with unions and especially with those dominated by Irish Catholics. A multitude of dangers stalked the Irish in Butte, and the draw of high wages came at a terrible long-term cost. The arsenic-laden dust weakened and scarred miners' lungs and left them vulnerable to tuberculosis. One woman noted that most miners seemed to die at a young age. Watching her father crippled by the miners' con, she saw how he was like an old man. He died aged 52. The rush for rock heightened the dangers in the mines as the Anaconda Company enacted new safety programs throughout the years, which management and workers dutifully ignored. The conditions meant that Butte had held the sad distinction as having the worst mining fatality rates in the world. The language of one Irish lament was more direct. I came to Butte City to work for Jim Brennan and now dig my grave. The Irish were well aware of the risks after weighing the dangers in his mind, an Irishman recalled, the mine was very healthy on account of sulfur or brimstone that was in the copper, but the pay was good and we worked as well as we were able. Metal miners earned $932 a year compared to the average worker's yearly income of $639. The dangers extended to families as well. Between May 1913 and May 1914, a startling 152 people died from tuberculosis five of whom were women. <coughs> women were left unhealthy from washing clothes saturated with bad, bad air and giant powder smoke and were compelled to inhale the deadly fumes. 
During an American fundraising tour, Douglas Hyde observed Butte as his train pulled into the station, and the Irish linguist noted the effort of the actor there, in writing Osgeilge, but I translated here for you. I am certain it is the most horrible place that I ever saw. There isn't a tree, a bramble, a plant. There isn't even a stalk of grass in or around it. There's miles and miles surrounding it without any growth. Everything has been burnt or eaten by the smoke that comes from the great chimneys in which Senator Clark smelt his copper. And of course, you note that he points the finger at Senator Clark rather than Mr. Daly. <laughs> The entire population was affected, including children who suffered a higher than average fatality rate, succumbing to sickness from the smoke and dust that claimed their fathers. Across the industrial landscape, children played and predictably suffered accidents, sometimes falling down mine shafts that pocketed the ground. The heavy toll of human life was infamous as far away as Western Ireland, where one song called Butte, a town quote, where the streets were paved with Irish bones. The Irish faced down the dangers and continued to flock to Butte because they were respected there and they earned some of the highest wages offered to immigrant workers in the US. Marcus Daly's notorious bias ensured that during his time as owner, the Anaconda, Anaconda Copper Mining Company, bias was directed against known APA members and orange men. This was not simply Irish Catholic prejudice or collective memory, but rather ethnic solidarity against those who, outside of Butte, usually had the advantage over them. Ethnic solidarity naturally meant a degree of ethnic exclusion. And I'm afraid we don't have time for the, the real rough stuff in Butte, but there's some good stuff in there. I think you'll enjoy it. I suppose I have to give you an incentive, a reason to buy the book. Well, what it is is the, the rise and fall of Butte, in effect, as a solid um, Irish community. And uh, we'll see what you think of it. But, I'll go to the conclusion now so that we have a time for some questions and an all discussion and a bit of a chat. Um, on the topic of the Cornish in America more generally, and I'm just darting back to Ronald James, um, he states that their unity developed as a response to antagonism shown to them by the Irish. Expressions of conflict between the Irish and Cornish run the gamut from shooting, knifing, or other forms of fatal violence to bar fights and street brawls in the mining towns of the American West. However, James did not distinguish between murderous intent and faction fighting, which, however appalling to modern sensibilities, sometimes represented a form of competitive sport between ethnic groups and was typical of much of the history of the American West. Roman Burkhoff is similarly mistaken in stating that, quote, anti-Irish sentiment among British Americans was quite spontaneous. In fact, anti-Irish sentiment among the Welsh and Cornish miners originated in their homelands of Britain, as seen in the notably in the anti-Irish riots in Camborne and Tredegar, and was carried over to the US. One contemporary wrote, the Irish have to encounter considerable prejudice in almost every section of the Union, though in different degree. The present book, contained many instances of this prejudice. As one historian of the Chinese in the West notes, however, we must be careful to avoid the group becoming, quote, more celebrated for what happened to them than what they accomplished. As important to contextualize the hostility towards the Irish and from them towards others does not excuse their actions, in particular against the Chinese in Leadville and their participation in the explicitly racist Working Men's Party of California. The Irish clung tenaciously to a cultural distinctiveness and a defensive sense of superiority over the English. <coughs> the English language lads will be chased heads forth. Sentiments born from centuries of cultural persecution and political resistance. As an oppressed and weakened people, they were a defeated underclass in their own land and a, col and a colony within the global and domineering British Empire. Rivalries were a cause of many faction fights, and a poem about a Cornish miner tells, I hitchhiked to Old Butte, Montana, and met an Irish bloke. I said Ireland should have her freedom. He said, excuse me, Ireland should have her freedom. Queen Elizabeth was a joke. I started to weigh into him, his partner, he got sore. When I woke up the next morning, I was sprawled out on the floor. <laughs> Both ethnic solidarity and adversarialism were integral parts of the Irish nationalist narrative. 
These themes follow through in English language songs, such as the closing verse of this song commemorating the death of an Irish rebel in County Cork during the abortive Fenian Rising in 1867, 1867 and sung by Matthew Hannafin in Butte. God rest you, Peter Crowley, you sleep beneath the clay, but someday you'll return again to lead us to the fray, with a thousand men at your command, be they all both loyal and true, that will conquer English, Dutch, and Dane, as Irishmen can do. Harking back to the centuries-old Irish conflict involving William of Orange and the Vikings, and I haven't seen any trace of that song in Cork, which is remarkable. So think of that, that this song translated, or I should say, brought over in the late 19th century, survived in Butte until the 1920s when it was recorded, disappears in Ireland. So all sorts of little threads are sort of existing there. This tendency, frequently referred to as clannishness, fails to fully describe the degree of insulation and the cultural attribute lent to the Irish wherever they faced a cold welcome. Similarly, the experience of the famine cannot be quantified solely by mortality statistics. The Irish who lived through those harrowing years experienced a cultural shock that unquestionably left a psychic scream echoing down through the generations. Whatever the effect of the conditions in Ireland and Britain on the Irish Catholic immigrant, they knew they were an oppressed people. And the Great Famine encapsulated the evidence of this historical mistreatment. Evidence of the strength of their convictions can be found in the huge list of mining towns that donated to Irish nationalist causes and perhaps in the creation of schools, churches, and hospitals to take care of their own. The story of the firebrand labor activist, Mother Jones, serves as an example of the sense of conviction and the growing sensitivity of Irish Americans towards other groups. The Cork Barn, Mary Harris, had an undeniable influence as a national organizer and agitator for workers' rights. Harris utilized her Irish background in her speeches and writing to preach unity to workers of various ethnic backgrounds. Quote, miners were considered a bad class, they came from different countries, they were of the kind that believed in settling all differences by force, as in Ireland years ago, the inhabitants of one country would fight against those of another until there was a continual trouble, until there was continual trouble. She traveled throughout the American West acting as a labor unifier and as a speaker during major strikes, earning the art of business and local government resulting in her being forcibly escorted from Colorado in the months before the Ludlow Massacre. And that's actually the origins of when she'd be coming around the mountain, if you're wondering. She'd be coming around the mountain when she comes. That's Mother Jones, who is repeatedly kicked out of the state and then sneaks back in each time to help the workers. Her work necessitated a keen sensitivity to ethnic identity. Oh, actually, move. that's more about Italians. Um, Mother Jones also represented a sea change in trade union organization in America. Mining unions in the 19th century often became exclusive organizations for both a specific class and ethnic group to protect their narrow section of workers' interests. This occurred particularly when mine companies imported unskilled workers to try and break the power of the unions in town. Later, unions operated on the basis of adversarial inclusiveness in their efforts to establish a decent standard of living through living, living wage and to further the goal of worker solidarity. John Mitchell, the leader of the the Irish leader, I should say, of the United Mine Workers, clarified these sentiments and described a living wage as, quote, a wage that would afford a worker a sufficient amount of money to enable him to live as we believe a working man should live, educate his children, clothe them properly, and to save sufficiently. Mitchell further told workers that, our constitution provides for the admittance as members, and in fact, our obligation provides that we must not discriminate against any man on account of creed, color, or nationality. He also believed workers in the union should raise immigrant standards and oppose the entry of those who would not aspire to this standard, a qualified inclusivity. The hyphenated identity that Irish immigrants had done so much to make an acceptable fact in American society was also used by other immigrants to wrap their identity in a statement of loyalty to the new nation. But as labor unions adapted to ethnic rivalries, Others continue to see differences as inherently compromising their definition of America. In 1919, President Woodrow Wilson toured the US to convince a skeptical public of the importance of US membership in the new League of Nations. Heckled by Irish American and German American miners during a speech, he dropped his mask of geniality, saying, I cannot say it too often. Any man who carries a hyphen in his pocket 
is carrying a dagger to stab into the entrails of our republic. An added irony was the fact that Wilson's Scots-Irish grandfather was born in County Tyrone. At the heart of the Anglo-American nativist attitude towards the Irish was the underlying belief that not only, uh, not only Catholicism, which was inherently anchored in the old world, but Irishness itself was a subversive form of otherness. Oaths of loyalties to the United States, such as those given by the AOH in Nevada, could never convince those who believed that Irish Americanism itself was disloyal. Such ideas, if less popular after World War I than in the late 19th century, continued to be widely held by men such as Wilson and guided their influential decisions well into the 19th century, uh, 20th century, excuse me. As in the case of most principles rooted in fear rather than reason, this one was self-defeating. And the irony of the hatred was that it solidified Irish allegiance to the structures of community, faith, and identity within that hyphen of Irish American, America that anchored them in the new land and buttressed their descendants from the worst effects of this nativism. The Irish American Association in Salt Lake City, announcing a ball in honor of the father of Utah mining, Patrick Edward Connor, may have gone too far in the opposite direction when it came that no Irish were there because of love of greed, but that they only sought to promulgate the tenets of allegiance to the flag. Irish loyalty was not quite as pure as that, since there was the expectation of opportunity, and some were disappointed or disillusioned by the American experience as Michael McGowan was after his return to Donegal. He vowed, Vah love America, August Bavin Minnick, a Dork May, a Minteen Fame, the Ma Rod A, August Guduchen, Clan Clicker, the Ligfig, Ain Dinna, a Coo, a Nain Gubra, Var Lum, a Gor, Crinu Brathog. I didn't care for America, and I often said to myself that if I ever had a family, I never let one of them go there. I'd rather have seen them gathering rags. Despite the existence of these heavily Irish towns, this American opportunity remained an elusive objective for many. The story of Irish miners in the US remains a complex one, with a diverse series of outcomes for the many immigrants who went there as miners or entered mining towns seeking employment. A few made their pile and struck it rich, such as Thomas Cruz and Marcus Daly. As Terry Coleman notes, the immigration movement is heroic to look back on, but for the individual emigrant, it was often a personal tragedy. And Cruz's life certainly fits that description. Their migration to and through the US shows the Irish traveling in search of opportunity and desperate for security. Despite the mid-century horrors of the Great Famine, most remember their homeland fondly, with their memories rooted in the nationalist narrative that Ireland was subjugated to a cruel British governance by an arrogant ruling class. The Irish miner John McHugh wrote a ditty, although I'm in America, the land of liberty, I still live in expectation on Ireland to see. Their lives rarely resembled heroic tales. Instead, they chiseled their way through life and pushed their children to attain better lives than the ones they themselves endured. The object of their blame for difficulties were circumstantial. For example, Patrick Kearney blamed the hordes of immigrants to the US who were willing to work for, quote, mere nothing. And he wrote in 1890, I have done a good deal of running around in America seeking the best place, but all my sorrow I have lost by it. The American country is gone. Highlighted in Kearney's aching disappointment was his initial belief that America had once offered hope of a better life, but that it did no longer. Irish miners came to America in the 19th century with this same belief but found reality at odds with it. Their hopes often clashed against a relentless drive for profit and an unprecedented expansion of private and corporate power in society. For Irish miners in the 19th and early 20th century, the root of their insecurity lay not in the dangers of their work or the instability of the natural resources, but rather in a model of business that viewed their conditions as unimportant, their organizational skills as treasonous, and their identity as an opportunity to isolate them from an American society they sought to become a distinctive, contributing part of, despite great difficulties. In 1916, after another series of vicious disputes between mine workers and businesses, the US government launched an inquiry that resulted in the publication of the final report of the Commission on Industrial Relations. This report stepped away from past political tendencies 
which had blamed immigrants for not seizing the supposedly self-evident opportunities politicians and business leaders presumed were inherently available in America. Instead, the report announced a new vision for the country. In a startling departure, it stated, with the inexhaustible natural resources of the United States, her tremendous mechanical achievements, and the genius of her people for organization and industry, there can be no natural reason to prevent every able-bodied man of our present population from being well-fed, well-housed, comfortably clothed, and from rearing a family of moderate size in comfort, health, and security. This echoed the Irish-American dreams of Nellie Cashman, the disillusioned hopes of Sean Rochelle and Seamus Omar Hartig, the exhausted hostility of Patrick Carrigan, and the stubborn resistance of Michael Mooney. The conflicts in mining region forced the nation to look in the mirror and see its multi-ethnic features clearly, and even eventually to see them as a possible strength rather than a weakness, as Woodrow Wilson did. The sentiment would find new flowering in the New Deal, and by then, the few remaining Irish miners had grown old. Most were buried in the graveyards of fading towns, or were relinquished to collapsed mine shafts. Their voices, their songs, and their prayers that had once echoed throughout the Irish-American West now silent. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.